to everyone. Um, thank you, Megan. Um, as always, recording the uh, um, recording these meetings, we'll go ahead and post it on the uh, web page for folks to to view. Um, but just kind of starting off, um, you know, so welcome, good to see everyone, and, and thanks for uh, you know spending the time with us. Um, we shortened the meeting to ninety minutes. I know everyone is extremely busy right now. Um, and uh, we just want to make sure that we're uh, very efficient in our time. So we got 90 minutes together um, and did throw out an agenda, just kind of a quick overview. Um, I want to start off by looking at where we are and where we're headed. Um, we're kind of at this point uh, hitting um, uh, the end of June where we're going to be submitting reports to legislature on um, the 20-year strategy um, and then talking about what does the future look like. And Ryan's going to kind of lead that conversation and, and that discussion. Um, and then we'll move into uh, discussing feedback from the draft report that was sent out. Um, and I'll go ahead and lead that conversation and, and uh, um, we'll talk about that. And then we'll move into an investment strategy. Um, we got some feedback about improving the investment strategy aspect of um, the 20 year. And uh, we'll talk about a couple of different pieces there. One of them being um, acres and costs. Um, Sean's gonna lead that conversation. And then also talking about some of the components that are needed um, to really move this uh, strategy into implementation in the next phase. And then we'll wrap it, wrap it up at 3.30. So um, as always, I'll kind of facilitate the overall meeting, try to keep us on track. Um, we'll try to keep our conversations uh, concise. If there's any follow-up, I'm happy to have those conversations offline, um, et cetera. And uh, we'll go from there. So um, is there any questions or comments on the agenda before we jump into it? Okay, excellent. Um, so first off, um, just kind of a quick overview of where we are and where we're headed. Ryan, I'm going to pass that to you and um, we'll kind of go from there. Yeah, thank you. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, and I just want to echo uh, Nathan's uh, message to all of you. Thank you for continuing to engage. Uh, I know I've been in and out of this space, uh, but have seen uh, all of your faces here regularly. And I know it's a big commitment and it's really appreciated. Um, I think you know it's clearly helping us to um, drive this process and uh, make it successful, and and I hope make it successful long term. Um, as Nathan said, I just wanted to kind of share some um, thoughts and perspective on uh, where we're at. And if you uh, tuned into the Board of Forestry meeting last week of uh, In Sisters, uh, my comments will be pretty familiar. I'm speaking from the same notes uh, that I used for that meeting. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I definitely want to say that I, I heard the feedback the last time this group got together. Um, and I know that um, some folks would like to see uh, maybe a little bit more depth in the um, strategy or maybe a slightly different approach to how it's uh, put together. Um, but from my perspective, I think we've made a really valuable investment in where we're at right now. Um, and, you know, to me, that is about creating the right conditions to be able to um, effectively implement uh, the intent of the shared stewardship MOU and the 20 year strategy. Um, I think I mentioned at the board meeting you know, that the direction in, in SB 762 on the one hand is pretty straightforward. Um, on the other hand, it's not necessarily very straightforward. Uh, certainly, we could have easily created a static document. But um, from, from my perspective, um, I think the value is, is really in building the capacity and social capital around this body of work that allows it to be um, relevant and persist and really helps to institutionalize um, some of the mechanisms that we need in place to be able to effectively identify and set shared priorities and um, direct funds into those priorities, even as environmental and social factors um, shift over time. You know, I think that's, that's really the, the key to making this um, work long lived. Um, so it's not just about the plan, it's about having the right conditions. Um, so, you know, sort of that quick review of, of uh, where we're at to date, um, as I already mentioned, um, the team has been working really hard to help formalize shared stewardship, um, including the governance that describes how 
the state and federal agencies work together, but also how, you know, over time, how we're going to engage tribes um, and uh, this group and other groups that will continue to provide input to this body of work. And I apologize if you can hear the lawnmower is running around outside my window as it always does whenever I have a meeting like this. Um, but it's through it's through that through this shared stewardship um, structure and forum that we're really able to identify um, overlapping priorities. And that doesn't mean that everybody's priorities change. It just means that we look for those places where there's alignment and we agree collectively um, that we want to try to align our priorities and, and work together. Um, I already mentioned, you know, kind of laying the foundation for engagement of tribes and existing collaborative groups that are doing work across the state, in particular, really understanding their needs and the barriers um, that they face and trying to put work on the ground. Um, we've also identified priority geographies and some uh, priority actions uh, for both forest and range restoration work statewide. And that I think is really the basis for coming investment in the development of some decision support tools um, and a dashboard. And I know that Sean is going to talk more about some of that today. And then finally, kind of tying it all together, we've described some of the near-term investments that are needed to um, fully develop and implement a 20-year strategy. And that's really um, the next step um, in, in the direction that we're headed here uh, with all of our partners. Um, so uh, having said that, you know, I, I, I also want to acknowledge again, as I did at the board meeting, um, all of the really good local work that we do in Oregon. Um, there's, you know, we often refer to it as the Oregon way. Uh, I know I've seen some publications out there uh, with that title. Um, and I think it's, you know, it's really important to acknowledge um, that this, this body of work isn't intended to um, replace or direct any of that work. Really what we're trying to do is create uh, better support via more coordination uh, statewide and mechanisms to address some of the institutional barriers that exist to putting that ground on the work, uh, putting that work on the ground locally. Um, and also create the conditions to build capacity and plan projects in high priority areas uh, where work isn't currently moving forward. You know, I think that I'm sure this group could agree that is that's clearly a, um, an important um, place to focus. Um, and then finally, to develop the interagency coordination and capacity that is necessary to better track and report on the progress of all the work that we're doing statewide, um, to better be able to tell the story, the impact, um, be able to um, better identify uh, where we are making progress and identify those areas where we're not, but we know we should be and, and focus our investments there. Um, that I think is a, is a critical piece that is, is missing. And it's not easy to build, particularly when we think about all the different agencies and groups that work in this space and the data that needs to be shared. Um, so I certainly look forward to being able to um, try to make some investments in those tools uh, over the next couple of years. So Nathan, I hope that, um, you know, as I said, those comments were primarily from the board meeting, but I felt they were pretty relevant today with this group and where you're headed. I'll pause um, and welcome feedback and conversation uh, before Nathan continues on the agenda. Yeah, thanks, Ryan. Um, Folks have any questions, comments, thoughts on that? Um, I'll go ahead and call them out. Uh, Susan Jane, um, go ahead. Yeah, thanks everybody. Um, <clears throat> so I remember that we had a, a fair amount of feedback on the draft plan. Um, and I know one of the things that was a sticking point for folks um, was the priority landscapes and how those were identified and what they were and, and that sort of thing. But I'm not sure where we actually ended up landing on that. 
Um, can you give me an update on, on where we landed after the resolution to it? So you, you uh, sort of, you dithered in and out there on my end anyway with my connection, but I yeah. think I got all of that. Um, you were asking about uh, the priority geographies and some of the conversation around that and where we landed based yes. on the feedback that we received. Okay. Yep. Yep. And so Nathan, I think you're probably going to address that today, right? In the agenda. Yeah, yeah, um, and I can I can start with that. Um, so a couple of different things. Um, looking at where those priority geographies current, currently stand, and then trying to explain more how we got there. So one of the one of the things we're doing is developing um, kind of the methodology and the layout of how we got there. I think some feedback we got is folks like, "How did we get to this point?" So we want to go ahead and lay that out, and we're working on a document that hits all of those points. Um, the second piece of it is how we display it, and we're looking at um, different aspects how we can display that map. And one of them being looking at uh, the QWRA as we started with, with those high risk areas, um, and then really, you know, identifying those as kind of that first starting point and then adding on to the landscape health um, or the landscape resiliency aspects and the methodology that we went to get there and displaying that as well. And then where those areas uh, intersect, I think is a, a key component on top of then where were the areas that we expanded due, due to uh, other agency priorities, et cetera. Um, in regards to the actual geographies, um, there's still a feeling of, you know, we need to identify priority geographies. Going to a, um, a heat map um, doesn't necessarily identify where they are. And we need those uh, priority geographies. And that moves into um, how we identify where are the acres and, and the overall cost as well that we're going to have that conversation. I'm not sure if um, Sean's going to uh, display that map that looks at kind of those different layers of, of how we got there. So. Um, that's really where we landed and keeping that forward progress. Um, and I wasn't in that last meeting. I heard a lot about it and um, the different aspects, but hopefully that answers the question. Um, and if there's follow-up too, and Dylan, I see your hand is raised. I don't know if it's a follow-up or. Yeah, yeah, no, it is. So what level are you guys looking at that at? And then do you anticipate defining a number of priority geographies at that scale and then putting together a more detailed assessment associated with the implementation plan there? Like, what's the strategy? That yeah, it's a good question. And I think um, to follow what you're asking here, so we ran that analysis all at the um, Huck 10 watershed level. I'm not sure if that's uh, the specificity you're looking for. Um, that's where we ran that. And then what we're looking for, and this is where the near-term components and next steps is really looking at those local assessments and understanding within these big, broad geographies, where are the areas of um, the highest priority? And I'll talk a little bit about kind of the next steps and really identifying that we need to build off of previous assessments and, um, and really support that work. And I think that's an important aspect of it to really hone those areas in to look at where are those specific priorities and really, a lot of the talks been that we want to do that at a local level um, and really struggling with doing it as a state level. We identified those big statewide broad, broad geographies and then and then digging in at a local level. And that's really the idea of how we can start narrowing those down. Okay, that, that, that's good. I mean, you know, we had shared our, uh, you know, Huck 10. We had talked about Huck 5 last time. I don't know the right number, just in terms of the acreage that we want to bite off. but what we had communicated and a couple other folks had communicated was a desire to i do think we do this group was convened and the state was convened with the intent of identifying some high level priority geographies and then the actual implementation plan can and should be developed at the district level with partners to actually put that together but by the end of this exercise we should have five or ten priority geographies across the state that are manageable and to say this is where we will be going over the next five years here in Oregon and then we will be developing detailed assessments for an implementation and an investment plan associated with these as the first course of action to implement the 20-year strategy and then we would be developing an additional pipeline of future geographies and lower tiers as we move along through the 20-year process but that would be our request about what we would like to see to, 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 to ensure that this is actionable. And that is, you know, we've talked about this, what, what Washington did um, was, it, was a similar approach to that and the way that DNR has continued to execute that and then frame their biennial budget requests 
to the legislature to secure the resources that they need. Yeah. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, Amanda, I see your hands raised. I don't know if it's a reaction or a separate question. Uh, sort of building off of Dylan. So, you know, I, I just wanted to double down with what Dylan said. Um, I think that was a good categorization of the comments from the last meeting. Um, and I'm sure we'll we'll get into this, Nathan, but just to to further go on with that, you know, I think the priority actions um that are currently located in there are are similar in kind of lack of detail and scope, um, similar to the priority geographies. And just the way that I'm thinking about the priority actions is obviously we're not going to tell every single person what needs to happen on every single acre or anything like that, but I think a more detailed list of of actions sort of sort of a suite of actions that can be chosen based on local needs is sort of what I'm thinking about um, whether we're looking at um, strategically placed fuel breaks you know thinking about pods or the use of pods um, you know and just different things like that um, that I think um, could and should be incorporated to kind of filter in you know again just thinking about how does this strategic plan at the state level be most useful as people are trying to develop their um, specific um, goals and objectives and needs at that implementation scale as we move down. So anyways, just wanted to build off Dylan. So thanks, Nathan. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. So I'm kind of hearing the priority geographies and the priority actions, drilling those down to more of a specific level um, is, is kind of what I heard from, from both of those. Yeah, I think at a high level, we would be able to look at this and say, here's the priority geography. This is how big it is. This is why we selected it in terms of the resource assessment and the risk assessment. An estimated number of acres that would need to be treated within that geography to achieve a meaningful risk reduction consistent with what we've seen in terms of science and then anticipated implementation practices that would likely be implemented in that area to, to, to get there. You might be able to do, you know, a high level capacity assessment in terms of partners that are there and who the lead on that would be, but creating that methodology and then there should be a rough budget estimate associated with that level of work that would need to happen. I mean, it's rough, right? And then I would look to the agency to then reach out to district staff and partners and convene them and to say, here's what we were, we're going to try to accomplish here, and then refine those numbers to put together the implementation plan, and then ultimately create a budget request. I mean, others might think about refining that, but that's, I think, like the level of detail that I think would be appropriate in a snapshot mm -hmm. that would effectively be that map and kind of a two-page analysis of what, we're, what we want to do in each of those areas. Sorry, I jumped in front of Joseph. Yeah, no, that's great. Sorry, Joseph, I didn't see you, but I do see your hand now. Sort of blends into this just paint, I know. Um, I just, before we just keep talking, I just wanted to get your reaction. Actually, I just raised my hand to try to give you some space to um, respond because there's a lot there. But just about, it seemed like what you all were saying is like, yeah, we're going to have the map, but maybe we'll do some display issues with the map, right? Like show, show QWRA or whatever, right? Mm -hmm. But like, what about having a tiered prioritization approach? Um, I'm, I just, I don't know if you actually heard a reaction yes or no, I'm just going to give you the opportunity. Yeah, absolutely. Um, no, I think that's really good. And I think what is desired is what we all desire and we want to get to. And that's where kind of the next steps that we're talking about as well is kind of that process to get in there and the challenges of working with the multiple agencies and the lack of tools, et cetera. And that's where we've outlined, um, we need the resources in order to start getting there. Um, and we need to continue the work um, with the agencies to get there as well. And part of the challenges I think we identified from the beginning as we started this process, at the same time, um, the Forest Service came out with the wildfire crisis uh, priority areas, the BLM just released their priority areas and working through shared stewardship is um, looking at where do we identify those areas where um, all the agencies really see the work that we need to be doing together. Where are those shared priorities? And that's what we wanna to get to next is really necking that down and identifying that. Um, now that we're starting to see all these priorities come out and then looking at um, how do we start thinking about years five through 10, 10 through 15 and 15 through 20. Um, and that, you know, starting with that five year of where we are, um, really drilling it and then thinking into the future as well. Um, and then also identifying 
uh, going to the actions, what are the actions? And really through uh, the process we've gone through is understanding there are lots of different actions that are needed in different geographies. Um, some of them need support within collaborative governance and getting agencies working together, um, working with the partnerships and collaboratives. Others need uh, some support with developing local strategic plans. There are other areas that have that, um, that are, are lacking uh, utilization opportunities, et cetera, and adds a lot of complexity to it. And that's where we wanna get to is start drilling that down and really going back to the understanding of, um, you know, essentially guiding the resources and the appropriate geographies for the appropriate actions. Um, and that's the process we're headed towards, um, but there's there's a lot more work and I won't deny that. And, and looking at um, kind of the next steps and the components that are needed, that's that's what we're trying to get to. So, um, Ryan, I see your hand is raised. Yeah, I mean, I think you hit on a lot of the things that were kind of, on, excuse me, in my mind. Uh, just a couple of thoughts that I, I think I would focus on. You know, one is that um, this is not just an ODF product. Uh, we were asked to work with our partners in shared stewardship to develop it. Um, <clears throat> and uh, that's, you know, that's not an easy, an easy task. And that's where I get, that, that's where I started with my comments up front about really creating the conditions um, to be able to articulate uh, clearly, uh, clearly articulate shared goals and shared priorities um, with all of those partners. And my impression specifically of the Washington DNR plan um, is that that is something that they primarily put together on their own and have driven um, on their own. And that is a little bit easier, I think, than uh, this, the, the shared stewardship um, approach. And uh, and then the other thing that I would that I, I wanted to highlight, and again, I kind of tried to um, hint at at least in my opening comments, is, you know, frankly, the difference between developing a document that um, is really useful for uh, kind of, I guess, I'd say, immediate, you know, political um, uh, display, if you will, in terms of attracting um, investment based on. Um, some kind of prioritization and some some dollar amounts versus um, really making that long-term investment in, again, the conditions um, to be able to um, tell that story uh, effectively into the future and to be able to tell that story as conditions on the landscape change, either as a result of climate change investments that we're making or changes on the social side around political support, funding, um, et cetera. Um, so I don't know if I, I do, you know, I guess I'm, I'm just calling out, I think some differences in the framing and the approach to what this product ought to be. Um, and, I, and I think it's important um, to understand at least where, where, we're, where we're coming from um, and the work that we've done at this point, particularly with our state and federal partners. Um, so Nathan, I hope I hope that's helpful. But no, this has all been really helpful. Um, and, and Dylan, I appreciate you um, throwing um, that information into um, the chat as well. And, and it's kind of a good transition that I'll um, take us to the next one is um, uh, looking at um, feedback from the draft report. I just got some really good feedback. Um, from y'all and, and I'll just kind of jump into this next section. And I think what y'all are talking about is, is where we desire to get to. And, and once again, um, it's gonna take some time and need of the resources to get there. So um, just kind of jumping in feedback uh, that we heard. Um, first off, I just wanna thank everyone um, for providing feedback and comments. It's extremely helpful and that's why we sent it out. Um, we've taken that feedback um, uh, to heart and really looking at how do we get to the next step. Um, the first piece that I want to throw out is um, we threw out that draft report to um, the agency coordination group uh, of the agencies, um, threw it out to this group and also to the regional partnerships and collaboratives. And we got some good feedback from, um, from a lot of different folks and a lot of different perspectives as well. And once again, I think it shows um, really the breadth of uh, what people want out of this. Um, first thing I want to say there is um, the first, the biggest feedback that we got is that it wasn't really strategic enough and it was very process driven. And um, we understand that and took that to heart as well um, and saying, okay, we need to rethink the, uh, rethink the way that we put this together. Um, so 
I just wanted to call that out um, and look at that aspect. Um, the other thing is, um, like I had mentioned, a lot of intent uh, for the strategy of what people want. Um, really, the big feedback from the agencies is um, what they want out of this is working together on shared stewardship and how we work together on priority geographies and the actions um, and really thinking about how we can narrow this down, leverage our resources, um, and think about the limited capacity that we have agencies have and how we can really support um, working together to increase our capacity. So that's one aspect that the agencies really um, wanted to see from this. Another one is um, kind of hearing um, what I just heard too, is really narrowing it down of where are the acres that we need to treat um, uh, at a more specific level. Um, and we heard that as well. Um, where exactly are the acres that we wanna treat? Um, the current maps we're looking at is, is very large um, and, and understand that as well. And then another big one is um, how are we going to build capacity? Where's the capacity? Um, I just want to call out those three are all very large monumental tasks that are extremely important. Um, and that's the feedback we got from folks is um, how to look at those three different aspects um, amongst many other things. Um, so three big ticket items, but uh, we really... Um, you know, working on um, relooking at how we put this, uh, this the document and how we put the strategy together with that feedback. Um, I also want to hit on with those three things. Um, that's a lot of work and it's a lot of resources to get there, um, but really committed to getting there. Um, let's see here. Um, so just kind of some things that we've done with the reports um, and then moving into the strategy. One of them is uh, restructuring the report um, and more adequately displaying the strategy and, and removing some of the process. I think that's a key piece that a lot of folks really gave um, feedback is thinking about, OK, how is this more of a strategy instead of a report on the process that we went through to get here? Um, by doing that is really bringing up the vision, strategic elements. Um, the agencies really want to develop principles of how we operate, integrating that. Um, and then taking a lot of that process and putting it into the appendix. It's all really important. And that's feedback that we got um, from folks saying um, it's important that we display this stuff, um, how we develop the strategy to this point, what is the governance, who are the people involved, et cetera. Um, and then also um, advancing the investment strategy. We heard a lot about um, you know, advancing that in investment strategy and addressing the acres that we want to treat um, and how are we addressing that capacity and readiness. And we're, we're working towards um, really digging into that and identifying that as well. Um, and then the acres, we've talked a lot of, about that as well. Um, and then uh, obtaining the resources. How are we going to get the resources to do this work? And that's where um, looking at some of those near-term components for implementation um, to get to the, the space that I, I think we all desire that we want to get to. Um, and then the last thing I just want to hit on is there is a commitment from the agencies to work together, and there's a commitment to the agencies to, to drill this down and really get to that point. Um, so um, really looking at of how we get there, um, I think is really important. So um, that's kind of leads into some of the future conversations that we want to have today as well is um, taking that information, taking the feedback and looking at, OK, how do we start looking at acres, actions and costs? Um, and then those components to get uh, to the point where we can drill it down, really identify those priority geographies. What are the actions? Um, and then how we can move this thing into implementation. So um, just wanted to, to once again reiterate, we heard a lot of feedback and, and we took it to heart um, in looking at how we can continue to drive this thing into the future and the, and the place that we want it. So um, once again, um, leave some space for conversation. Heard a lot of, of feedback previously, um, but just wanted to um, open that up as well. If there's any other questions or comments on, on um, kind of those aspects that I threw out there. I think John has his hand up, or is your arm just up? No, I'm just uh, resting my arm. <laughs> Amanda? Yeah, I'll ask a quick question. So, I guess I'm st I'm a little bit unclear, Nathan, with what you guys are putting together for the legislature, because you guys are putting together something, right? And I think there was a little bit of concern at the last meeting of like, 
oh my gosh, is this like the plan? Like, <laughs> is this going to be the, the, the final thing? Or when, you know, if it isn't, then what is going to be presented? And, um, and then from there, you know, what does the timeline look like to try to get to the final plan, given that there's been a lot of feedback that there seems to be, you know, an iterative process that needs to happen to kind of reach that final um, plan, um, recognizing that there is probably going to be future work um, at the at the landscape level, kind of like what, what Dylan put in the chat and, and really yeah. getting down into the implementation piece. So can you kind of ex explain that a little bit? Um, Cause it sounds like you got a lot of really good feedback and I really hope that that can be integrated. Yeah, absolutely. Um, right, I'm happy to start this. And if you got feedback too, um, you know, please kick in. So um, when we started this, we were really looking at, um, you know, looking at the language um, and like we talked a lot about, you know, dreading the language from um, the MOU, et cetera, but really no um, clear, definition of exactly what this needs to be and no clear definition of when it needs to be done. Um, and we, you know, really looking at that aspect that we want to make sure that we get this done right. Um, what we've always looked at is getting a report on progress of where we are um, to this point, excuse me, um, was really the desire, understanding that there's going to be a lot of work to really develop um, a shared stewardship strategy to make sure that we're hitting the components that we want to hit. Um, there's a lot of work put into the reports. Um, but, um, you know, that was really the intent of it to say, hey, here's all the work that we put into this. Here are all the pieces. Um, it was never intended to be the strategic plan, the strategy. Um, and what we want to do is, is the feedback that we got is start ripping that apart and putting it more into a strategy. Um, and that's what we're intending to do. And then building the components that we, with, that we need to continue building. For example, um, how we start narrowing down those priority geographies and the actions, um, redefining and developing um, goals, um, et cetera. So um, that is really uh, where we're trying to get to. Um, and um, I think there's a lot of pieces there. There's just there's just more work that needs to be done. And that once again goes into, um, you know, to get the resources and, and, and really put the resources to start um, getting down to that defined level that I think a lot of people desire. So, Brian, I know we've talked about this a lot. Do you have anything to add there? Or are you feeling... No, I, I think you hit it uh, pretty well. Um, this is this is going to be a report that describes uh, the work to this point and the work that needs to happen and the investments that need to occur to try to get to the, the, the place that I hear, especially this group asking for. Uh, we simply couldn't do it uh, in the time that we had, uh, again, about creating those conditions and making those investments. Yeah, thank you, Amanda. That was, that was a great question. So any other follow-up or anything I didn't answer there or folks have other questions on some of that? All right. Um, I, I think, I don't know if that's good or bad. Um, I'll say it's good that we're right on um, the agenda, which I think is always the intense, but also want to leave space for um, to make sure that if people have additional questions, comments, et cetera. Um, so we'll transition. I'll also throw out there that if people do have follow up questions, if we're not really providing um, all the information, you know, feel free to reach out. I'm always available um, and, and will continue to make myself available. Um, so, yeah, Amanda. Yeah, I just have one other quick question. So, um, are you? going to be providing any sort of um, comprehensive document or anything where we can review what type of feedback other people gave? Because um, right now it kind of seems like people are providing feedback to you and then it's sort of going into a black box and then, you know, something else is going to pop out at the end. And, I, and I'm just really curious what other people have to say and how they're viewing it and what they're thinking about. Um, not saying that I need to know who it came from or anything like sure. that, but sure. I'm just, I mean, personally curious kind of what other types of feedback you, you kind of gave it to us a little bit here and just yeah. some buckets, but, um, but are you guys going to do anything like that? Or, or are we just going to kind of see your um, kind of finished project, you know, at the end of it without really seeing how the sausage is made? <laughs> yeah, no, it's a great question. We've definitely had that conversation of how we take that. And I'll be honest, I think there is also a challenge in that we've gotten so much feedback from so many different places and how to synthesize that 
and, and I'll be honest, um, the sausage that's being made is extremely challenging right now. Um, uh, put yourself in my shoes for a day. It's, uh, it's very challenging, but, I, but um, I think that's something that we've talked about. And I guess I would ask the question, is that something that is needed? And, um, you know, synthesizing that at a really high level, um, understanding that there are a lot of pieces in there. Um, but I'm kind of hearing from you that's something that, that you and others desire um, to see. Is that correct? Well, I don't want to speak for everybody else, but it's just something that I, it sounds like you got a lot of good feedback. And I think yeah. if we want to kind of do this sort of the, the Oregon way and, and really think that this group is really a bunch of different, really diverse stakeholders with lots of different perspectives, you know, this specific group would be a really good place to sort of digest some of that, I think, but, but others may have different ideas. Well, I'll, I'll just jump in there and say that uh, I uh, know that we can't get down to the nitty gritty detail. That would be a, a very uh, cumbersome process, but I do think that it would be very helpful to at least provide some high level buckets of that this is the type of stuff that we heard. Um, and uh, in so doing that also demonstrate this is how we used it. Yeah, thank you. So it sounds like that is something that we will we will work on um, and putting together. Um, yeah, excellent. Thank you for all that. I'm going to go ahead and transition us um, to the next piece of it. Um, as as one um, once again, some feedback that we really got was not a lot of strategy in the strategy and really looking at that investment strategy. And some feedback was. Um, what are the acres and what are the costs and um, trying to look at that aspect of it. So um, what I'm going to do is um, pass this over to Sean as Sean and the INR team have been helping us think through this with the agency coordination group and just what we're looking at currently um, within um, that aspect of it. And then we talk a lot about the desires that we want to get and then some of the near term components that we want to get to um, that we need to think about investing in, in order to uh, to. Uh, really further refine many aspects of the strategy. So, um, Sean, I'm going to go ahead and I think you're still on here. Um, pass this over to you and um, take it away. Great. Thanks, Nathan. Yeah, so we've, um, one of the feedbacks we got uh, kind of late in the process here was we really need some numbers on treatments and costs based on the priority uh, geographies uh, that we've identified. And um, Mirica McCune here at the Institute for Natural Resources has done most of the GIS work for this. Uh, Megan Kreutzberg, who's a SageCon te uh, technical coordinator has also helped out uh, gathering and vetting some of the information. So what we're building on here was the Governor's Wildfire Council report, right? And how they went about it um, was, was a pretty simple approach, you know, taking the quantitative wildfire risk assessment, the, uh, the four highest risk classes there, which are outlined in black here, um, to get kind of a total priority area, which was about 14 million acres. Um, then they multiplied that by 40%. So there's, uh, you know, literature out there looking at what percent of the landscape do you need to treat to have uh, an effect on wildfire behavior. And th that, of course, ranges depending on uh, the type of ecosystem, the resources you're concerned about, the amount of, um, acreage open to treatment, all sorts of things. But in a, a literature review I've seen, they looked at 20 to 70%. 40% um, seems like a fairly reasonable compromise. It's what the Forest Service uh, Wildfire Crisis Strategy is also used in their kind of general assessments. 
So that's that's what the Wildfire Council did. They took this 14 million acres times 40% to come up with 5.6 million acres in need of treatment. Uh, they had a estimate of $720 an acre, um, which I, I have not tracked down where that came from, but that comes out to a total of 4.1 billion. So this is kind of the context that we have to be somewhat cognizant of as we um, come up with our estimates and uh, comparisons are made. So we've had, we have a somewhat different geography. Um, here is uh, a, a relatively new map, the one that Nathan was just referring to, saying within our priority geographies, uh, what was the rationale? What, what got them into that geography? Um, was it the wildfire risk map? Was it our landscape health uh, combined layers? Um, there was a addition of some areas uh, close to recent large wildfires. And then also from discussions we've had with uh, local efforts and, and agencies about some of their priorities. But anyway, somewhat different geographies. Here is the bottom line in terms of these calculations. Um, and our total acres were around 23 million for this uh, priority geographies. So then we split it in two. We did a separate calculation for forest lands and for rangelands, since there's really, we have different data sets for them and fairly different approaches in terms of identifying um, what areas uh, would be good for treatment. And the forest lands, we use this uh, layer that Ryan Haugo and um, Tom DeMeo and, and, and now recently um, Lachlan up at UW have been developing, started with the TNC work on identifying restoration forest restoration needs. And they were looking by different forest types, uh, the distribution of age and structure classes, um, looking at what was kind of outside of two standard deviations from the historical range of variation. And then identifying uh, those acres in those different forest and structure stages um, that were outside that kind of those bounds. And then summing those up by watershed, um, HUC 10 for the kind of high frequency uh, fire regimes. It's a fire return interval layer of zero to 35 years, uh, general low severity fire regime. Um, and they kind of, they increase sizes as the fire return interval went up just uh, you kind of have to do that to average things out because you can't expect every watershed to behave the same. Um, but just looking at the higher fire return intervals there, um, uh, and this is a map of on the right side there of the uh, percent of the watershed that comes out needing um, restoration treatment uh, based on, on their comparison. So then if we trim that down to our priority geographies, uh, we come up with a little bit over 5 million acres uh, in need of restoration. And again, this is just another view of their data set there and the colors, just how many acres needing restoration are, are in each watershed. Now, a big question that popped up here Oh, this is overall, so this averages out to be 31% of the land of the forested landscape um, needing treatment. Um, a question that came up then was, well, do we apply this 40% treatment efficiency uh, factor uh, to these data? And that's something we're we're still debating. It's uh, it's still kind of an open question. 
Um, I'll try to go back and look at some of the literature on, on whether the numbers that were generated were based on total forested acres or were they based on forested acres needing treatment uh, by some formula. But anyway, that's a question that we can open for uh, feedback here and uh, discussion. Sean, can I ask a quick question? I don't mean to sure. start I'm really into the curve, but I, I'm having a trouble reading that map. Okay. So the, so the, so this is the 5 million acres are watersheds that have the highest percentage of disturbance needed acres? They are any watershed within our priority areas. And sorry, the uh, I didn't have the, the, the priority outlines here that you're seeing have the wilderness areas and other things, you know, non-operable yeah, areas right. cut out, which really shouldn't be in this in this look map. Look at the outside black line. Look at the outside yeah, black line. Look at the outside black line. Uh, then it counts all watersheds within those lines, just adds up uh, the acres needing treatment according to that uh, restoration needs assessment. So every watershed will likely have some amount okay. of forest in it uh, needing treatment according to their formula. Right. So the 5 million acres we're not really seeing because it would be pixels all over the place. Exactly. We're, seeing, we're seeing a summary of it based on, on water. Okay, gotcha. Thank you. That's right. And that's a challenge that we faced here in terms of trying to do other overlays and remove things like wilderness areas because we don't know exactly where within the watershed the um, treatment acres are. So then uh, thinking about costs, um, in the, uh, in the uh, ODF's landscape restoration program, you know, this past year. Hey, Sean, can I just ask a quick question before we go into the cost discussion? Sure, Amanda. Yeah, just um, again, I want to make sure, just like Joseph, that I'm understanding the that last map. So if you could go back yeah. to that really quick. Mm -hmm. So um, this, what what uh what size uh, hucks are these? Because it looks a little bit different than the previous map where it had some that were combined. They should be the same. These are all watersheds, uh, ten digit hucks sometimes called fifth field huck. Sometimes people call them huck fives. Okay. Um, okay, so- Around 100,000 acres usually. Okay, and so the areas that are larger, like on the coast, um, they just, on this map, combined the, because I thought you said something about how they got combined based on the length of fire regime or what the fire regime looked like. So I guess I'm just trying to understand that. That's right, and that's not, fully depicted on this map. Um, you probably the lines just are faint around the coast range here. So you're not seeing them on the mm -hmm. on the hucks, but it doesn't really show um, the exact aggregation units here. So most of what we're concerned about out here on the east will be those will be the huck tens. Um, but yeah, it doesn't, where it goes down to the Huck eights, it's not showing, not shown on this map. And I actually do not have a, a, a map showing that at this point, but that would be a good one to have. Okay. So then, um, combining sort of this, uh, legend, right. For this one, where it shows the distribution of need of treatment, right. So as you go from, um, cool colors to warm colors, it's going up for the proportion of that watershed that needs treatment in order to achieve the desired kind of landscape resiliency or health that, that we want to achieve, right? Um, given exactly. a yeah. multitude of different, um, you know, reasons and risks that exist on the landscape. So then if we go to the next one, that percentage is now being broken down into acres based right. on the size of the the watershed. Is that how I am to understand it? Yep, that is exactly right. Okay, 
thank you all for letting me go on that journey. And thank you for making sure it's clear because the numbers are, you know, as you say, switching between percents and acres and so on. And I wanted to give kind of different views of it. They should uh, correlate pretty well, but they won't be exactly the same thing. Uh, so moving on to the costs, um, as I was talking about, the they're starting to track this new landscape um, restoration fund that ODF has been administering here for over the past year. Um, we got some numbers from that. Average costs, 972 per acre, but of course a wide range of actual costs depending on uh, what the treatments were, where they were, you know, financial returns, um, that sort of thing. Um, Mark Deschardin from ODF also provided some other numbers for comparison, some of the uh, NRCS work that uh, ODF has been involved with in Northeast Oregon has been up to twelve to $1,800 per acre. Um, and he said kind of more traditional support has been uh, around $1,000 acre for uh, the WUI and $600 dollars an acre for for non woolly landscapes and this is all forested land that again that we're looking at right at the moment uh, we do not have any numbers uh, uh, yet by location by forest type by treatment type obviously all important um, I'm not I'm pretty sure we're not going to be able to get there by the end of this month um, but something that we want to think about for the longer term so if we take this uh, 972 or roughly $1,000 per acre number and multiply it uh, by our little over 5 million acre number, we get a $5.1 billion uh, dollar total treatment need within our those you know rather large priority areas that we've defined. Any uh, questions, comments here before we move on to the rangelands? I have a question um, about this. I uh, well, I have several. Marco will probably ask some of them. <laughs> but one is uh, this one-time treatment. Like we just treat it. Okay. Because, um, you know, a lot of the stuff we're seeing is, you know, costs a lot more in the first entry. And if you can do enough entries to get to a point where you're using broadcast burning gets a lot cheaper. Um, but gosh, I would hate to see like this just one initial investment or maybe there's just some way to to make sure that we you realize that we're gonna need to do maintenance on this stuff. And so, I mean, 5.1 billion, it's kind of the initial investment, you know, um, and not to get into all the assumptions of costs and things, but I would just say one thing about costs is that ODF stuff is not necessarily the cost of the treatment, it's just what they are subsidizing per acre you know the treatments might actually cost a lot more than that mark would probably call us how much they're going to cost i'll lower my hand yeah thank you joseph and um i i think the devil is in the details with this because costs can really be a lot more than we anticipate and i know it is it is the trend of of people in charge of a lot of resources and being fiscally responsible, the mantra has always been to keep costs low. Um, and even that image and, and uh, perception and optics of, of, of what things really cost, just actually had a, a pretty deep conversation with Forest Service partners about this recently. Um, and what is included in those costs is I think gonna be really important. So the questions I would have, is it is it just, forest labor? Is there technical assistance uh, included in this? Is there um, prescription development, unit layout, designation, monitoring, any NEPA costs? Is it federal land? Is it private lands? Is it tribal trust lands? Is it, you know, so how, I think the details of how those costs uh, are developed are going to be really important. And then when we talk about the capacity issue, um, what is the long-term investment in, in a stable workforce? 
and livable wages and um, guest worker program, uh, H2B worker program or local workers, rural community employment over um, imported guest workers. So um, this can get kind of dicey, but I, I think this is a really important conversation that needs some exploration. Because from our experience, the conversation with our federal partners is we're looking more like $1,800 to $2,500 an acre for initial treatments. Um, you know, what's the density? What's the average? And how did that, uh, that same acre cost that's been around for 20 years hasn't really changed much. It's the same. It's this whole service contract. I'm going to be very straight here. It's uh, an underclass industry that's been built. And um, how do we elevate that? And how do we think holistically? So it's a little bit of a statement, but also some real questions on what is in that cost? And are there commercial um, components to any of this? Is it non-commercial? Is it prescribed fire? So I'll stop there. Yeah, Sean, if, if you don't mind, those are all the, the questions and, the, and that, that's it, you nailed it. And the challenge with this as well. Um, and, and within all good conversations, we start digging deeper and deeper into it and the challenge that we faced. <clears throat> and I'll hit on some of the components. The other challenge is, is having a centralized place to understand this information. You know, this is once again, a trying to track down what people know. Um, we haven't developed systems to track down this information to really understand it and analyze it. And the last piece I wanna hit on too is, <clears throat> and, and what I see in uh, Nils's um, comment here too, is um, if we just do standard costs per acre, um, we need to start moving into the right acres and the right acres might be harder acres, which might cost a lot more. Um, which adds a lot more to it. Um, and then all of the other factors that you hit on and also the size of projects. Um, are we doing a bunch of small projects at a higher cost? or Are we looking at large projects? And I think that's the desire we all want to get to is understanding the right acres with the right tools um, and understanding how we build large enough projects to get the economies of scale to reduce our costs and build industry and build product utilization that can reduce that cost. I think that's the desire <clears throat> from here to there there's a lot of questions and a lot of thoughts and a lot of work that's needed, but I just appreciate you calling that out, Marco, because I think that's it. Um, there are a lot of pieces to it. And Nathan, just one follow-up on that. Um, does this cost include all the agency administration? No. And overhead and time for setting up projects and- Yeah, and we talk- often, Yeah. There's oftentimes a community organization that uh, takes on that responsibility that uh, NRCS in an alternative funding arrangement agreement or even with ODF or Forest Service under different stewardship agreements, okay. we, we absorb that responsibility, therefore the costs go way up. Because those are the costs that are not usually calculated is all the agency planning and all the costs of administration and contract management. So I, I just wanted to point that out, that yeah. that cost needs to be pulled forward as well. What is the real cost to the taxpayer? Yeah. It's not just the, on the acre cost, but and I know point. that's not the goal isn't to solve that here. But when we're thinking about a long term strategy and investments and real numbers and capacity, it's I think it's a very important part of the conversation. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, thank you. I, I just jump in real quick, if I can, and say uh, that, uh, we, as Nathan said, we've had these conversations and will continue uh, to and, and in the report that's uh, forthcoming here, we'll try to put as many of those caveats in as, as possible to make that clear. Um, but I, I would say that's a, a body of work that needs uh, more attention and more development moving forward if we really wanna have accurate costs. Um, and, and something that I think uh, we ought to set our sights on as well, You know, kind of to my message earlier about where we're at and where we would like to be. You know. And I know Amanda's got her hand up, but uh, Ryan, I just wanted to follow up on that real quick. And uh, with NGOs that are involved in SB 762 work, we, we have actual costs, we have real numbers. So this isn't like a contractor who's bidding at a certain rate and amortizing profit, but there's actually real, there's some real numbers that can come out of this and there has been some work done. So um, I, I think that would be a good, to your point, uh, a really important follow-up. 
sorry, Sean, to um, step in on you. It was a great conversation. I'll, it looks like Amanda does have her hand raised. Sorry, Amanda. No, that's okay. Um, I think everything Marco said was was really spot on. So I appreciate all of uh, all of your com comments, Marco. So I have a few comments and then a few questions. Um, kind of to a point Marco just mentioned. So so obviously this is a very cursory um, uh, equation that was created here, and, and obviously it's not that easy. Um, I guess. Uh, one thing that I'm thinking about is, uh, as was already mentioned, that thousand dollars is typically just what is um, subsidized, and that's usually not the entire cost of of the of the project work. So, so there's that, but then also costs for labor and services are going up. Um, AOL is doing a wage survey right now for our members, and um, just some numbers I've seen recently just within, you know, the matter of um, like between 2022 and 2023. I mean, I've seen just costs for, I mean, this commercial treatments, obviously, but for choker setters, rigging slingers, et cetera, go up anywhere between three and $10 per hour. So, I mean, that's just within one year. And so that needs to be factored in this equation, this is basically saying if we were to do all of this treatment today with today's dollar at today's rates, this is how much it would cost. This number would balloon, I can guarantee you, if we actually think about the inflationary um, factors that would need to be included, um, looking at the costs associated with the entire 20 year time frame. So um, I don't have a solution for you <laughs> for that right now. If there needs to be an inflationary, um, you know, percentage that's that's put on to this or something, but but we we definitely need to be thinking about that. Um, now, in addition to that, um, before I have you respond, Nathan, um, the other things that I'm thinking about is I'm not I don't know for this that a thousand dollars per acre if that's just for non-commercial work or if there's any commercial value that is is brought in there. I think. You know, as we think about tools that are at the department and agency's disposal, thinking about GNA either used by ODF tribes or um, or counties, how can we uh, utilize that commercial value to offset non-commercial work um, costs? So I think there's opportunities there as well as stewardship contracting, MSAs, things like that at the federal level. So um, I think there's ways to, to back off that cost, right? As well as some of the work ODF is doing in combination with DEQ and, and me and Marco and a handful of others are engaged in biomass utilization conversations and thinking about how we add value or, or remove material from the woods that otherwise is causing a problem that could really help local communities that could really help us transition away from fossil fuel based products. Um, and there's a lot of really, really cool things happening in the renewable hydrogen, renewable natural gas um, spaces. And, um, and so I think that there's just, there's a lot of additional opportunity there to try to lower that cost. So, and I, and I don't remember seeing anything to that end in the strategy right now. I think that it, I think it should be, I think that it would really help, um, legislators probably swallow the pill of this dollar amount, especially as we try to uh, think about inflation and cost of, of doing business in the state over the next 20 year horizon. But, um, but anyways, those are just some some initial things. I know, um, Sean, you said that this wasn't split out by treatment type, but, um, but I think some of that information is probably pretty readily available. Um, so I, I would highly suggest we, we think about including including that. Um, that's all great. And Sean, I'm, um, I mean, I really appreciate, appreciate that feedback as well. I, I am going to, um, Sean, I don't know if you have a few more slides. I also want to transition to, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, some of these near-term components, because a lot of the stuff that we're talking about is critically important, but we haven't set up the infrastructure in order to do that. And that's some of the, um, the near-term components that we're trying to get to. So I want to make sure we have at least five to 10 minutes for that, but Sean, I want you to Go ahead and finish up if you have some stuff. I just want to make sure that we we get there. Well, we do have the other half of the state, so that's the 
often neglected rangelands. Um, here, just to remind you, is how we set priorities around the rangelands. Instead of looking at what was out of WAC, we primarily looked at what was in WAC in terms of what were the sage grouse um, core and growth areas. Um, as you can see in uh, orange and pink here. But then within those priority areas we identified, uh, we used some information um, that had been compiled by SageCon in terms of uh, these different eco-state classes that have been identified and what sort of treatments are recommended on the different classes. And they had a uh, recommendation for all of the classes, some form of treatment, um, except for two, which was the uh, B good grassland condition and the the high juniper cover. So those two were left out, but all other acres were counted here in terms of restoration need. Um, and then they were broken down by the, the eco state type and then the cost per acre to treat or maintain that type. And you'll note the costs here are much lower. Uh, we've gotten some feedback from one of our BLM rep representatives saying, you know, they've been a lot higher in, in some areas, uh, but we haven't gotten any specific numbers out of them. Uh, so this is what we're going with uh, at the moment. Uh, the treatment acres, since we're treating, you know, most acres uh, under here, or it's higher than under under the forest lands, 7.7 uh, 7 million acres total, and uh, one billion dollars in estimated total costs. And here's then just a, a summary of both those uh, estimates put together. But appreciate any questions or comments, um, particularly on the range side there. Yes, Marco. Yeah, I, I, I think your juniper costs are really low. Um, and and you know those costs may come from agencies and contracts, um, but I I just think overall I'm I'm just going to make a blanket statement that you're going to have to up your cost by twenty percent across west side and east side, and then thinking about um, you know uh, Amanda had mentioned it earlier inflation just cost of living increases and and the future. Um, if you want to be more accurate, it would just be safe to be more conservative. And, and um, I know it's not politically savvy sometimes with managing millions and billions of dollars, but um, we're, we're doing some quite a bit of, of juniper work uh, on the east side and uh, $350 an acre, 100 to 350 an acre, 1990s costs. And I, I would guarantee you, it would be interesting to ask what are the workers getting paid are they getting paid drive time? Um, th there's a big social equity element here that uh, there's some great research, OSU Extension, Emily Jane Davis, Carl Wilson with the Northwest Forest Workers Center now amortized into our organization. I, I, I would respectfully request that you up those prices if you wanna be a, pass a, a, a more respectful red face test. Good, appreciate it. John? Uh, yeah, I spec one of the reasons the juniper costs are as low as they are is, is that low to mid cover. I, I think the they left out the thick juniper, which once you cut it, you don't have understory, so nobody's going there, plus you're cutting, in a lot of cases, 1,200-year-old trees, which nobody likes to do. But uh, I guess the thing about this that's caught me a little bit by surprise is the the rangeland strategy that we've talked about and SageCon and the modeling it 
is more of a strategy of uh, protect the core and grow the core. A and this treating every acre doesn't fit that. And, I, I, and I'm not sure what, what's going on when you put $10 in an acre. I, I don't, I'm not even visualizing what's happening out there. So I need to do a little homework on this and, and I can do that. But uh, it, it just seems to be a little, uh, little out of sync with the strategy we've been talking about out here of, uh, you know, uh, I mean, I think the mapping to this point has been good. They found these places that were had good intact uh, ecological sites and focused on those. But uh, again, I don't quite see how you're you're treating every every acre in a grow the core and protect the core strategy. So I'm I'm a little bit lost here. Yeah, it is. Uh, I, I had that same question um and and things you'll see that in our priority areas here they are almost entirely covered by either core or growth opportunity areas so i think that was the idea that um these treatments were to preserve those areas and and that hopefully there would be uh a limited amount or much less treatment needed in those areas since they were in better condition to start out with. And so things like treating under uh, EcoState A there was, as I recall from one of Megan's documents was uh, just surveying and spot spraying for uh, weeds, but it was, you know, assumed to be, you know, good condition shrubland. So you know, it was fairly light touch was needed. So Megan Kretzberg would be the one to talk to about how these numbers kind of fell in place? Yes. Okay, I, I'll do that offline. Katie? I think Joseph had his hand up before me. Ah, sorry. I can't see everyone here. All right, go ahead, Katie. I'm Okay, I will, uh, just because I'm kind of following up on what John said. I really appreciate using the threat-based ecostate map, and I'm encouraged because this is integrating a lot of how we think differently about rangelands and risk in that context. But one thing I want to make sure that gets into here that I think John was alluding to, so the, the geographic strategy for Oregon, that, you know, that's what SageCon has embraced. And the thoughts there are, as he said, protect the core, grow the core. And so what that means is it's the inverse of what kind of we talk about when it comes to fire. We don't have to do a whole lot with core. What really matters is making sure that the bad stuff doesn't affect the good stuff. And so I'd really like to see more. Um, effort to prevent like wildfire transmission from the bad stuff that has higher probability of igniting and spreading fire. Um, so those degraded rangelands where we have a lot of invasives because that's what um, we're losing core to. That's the, what the sage, sagebrush conservation design that you had up there, Sean, um, tells us. And so I want like, do you, do you know, like was that integrated into this strategy? Uh, obviously, like I talk with Megan a lot about this, like that's very much at the heart of the geographic strategy. Did it make it into this strategy? No, there there isn't anything um, that I'm aware of specifically on um, preventing wildfire transmission from from more degraded areas in this in this uh, cost estimate. Okay, is there an opera? Is it too late to do that? Because that's like I said, we. Our wildfire risk is the inverse. Nathan had to listen to me endlessly <laughs> talk about this on our on our one on one, right? Like, our our good condition shrublands, you know, A through C, like we're that's that's good stuff. What threatens it is fires coming in from elsewhere, and so stopping those fires from those degraded places. And so I'm just thinking, like treatments, like. I mean, I, I know fuel breaks, like we, we don't want to say that's the only tool, but like certainly like just that concept of preventing fires from moving into core. I, I would love to see more of that. Um, and we can talk more if you'd like some references or reading or anything like that. 
Thank you. Yeah, well, the strategy will go on developing, so we can get that in there. I'm I'm not sure about over the short term here for the June 30th report. That's going to be challenging. But anyway, I should probably give it back to Nathan here pretty soon. Maybe Joseph. Yep. I think Joseph, and then I'll I'll follow okay. up. Oh, this is just a friendly reminder. Those are initial investments. I just wonder, even in these, I just I'm afraid that say decision makers see these, they'll they'll think like, oh, we spend this money, then the problem's solved. Um, I mean, we're talking about having to do this in those fire return intervals. You know, it's a it's a maintenance issue as well. So I don't know if that can be reflected in the in the graph. But I'll let you move on. I I think that's great. I, um, I'll I'll go ahead and kind of. Uh, follow into the next piece and wrap us up. Those are all the right questions and all the right comments. Um, it also proposes a lot of the challenges of a statewide strategy. Um, there's a lot of information, a lot of pieces, um, and wrestling with this is very difficult. Um, what I'm what I'm getting at here is really what the strategy calls out is looking at the next level of this and even looking at that cost, um, looking at those acres, um, is that realistic? Is it obtainable? Um, and thinking about how do we really start narrowing this down? Like I'd mentioned earlier of what are the right acres in the right place using the right tools? Um, and, and that's really the heart of this and wanting to get there. Um, and a couple aspects to it. So we've identified some near-term components to do that. Um, and just some of the challenges that we've identified is um, trying to understand um, what are the local strategies out there? There are areas that have them and there are areas that don't. Um, trying to understand what is the cost per acre and it's the classic, um, what's the cost per acre and everyone call a friend to try to ask a question. We don't have a way of understanding this amongst the agencies um, to say, okay, this is our cost. This is where we've done work, et cetera. It is um, spread all over the place. And what are the acres that we're treating? Um, those are huge challenges that we're facing and, and thinking about, okay, how do we start um, fixing some of those and how do we start identifying where are the areas where we really need to be placing these treatments and really focusing in, <clears throat> excuse me, um, and identified some components and we threw them in the original draft and still looking at those, but trying to get um, support, get funding um, to hit on some of these and some key ones that have really come up. Um, one of them being uh, the support for regional engagement and partnership. Um, the local partnerships, the local collaboratives, agencies on the grounds um, know where those areas are. That's where the work is happening, and they know where these key priority areas are in the right acres, hitting on the, some of those comments. Um, and we need to support that. And one of those is, um, you know, this is a shared stewardship strategy, looking at multi-agencies, looking at uh, cross-boundary work, and really supporting um, that work on the ground with uh, the agencies coming together, building local strategies, local assessments, and local work plans, and saying, this is where we really need to get going. Um, this is where we need to do work over an extended period of time. Um, and then also with that is supporting those, those landscape assessments and the planning, um, and those areas on the ground and identifying these key areas. Where are the critical watersheds? What are the critical areas of risk transmission, where are the areas that we can get access, where are the right acres to treat, et cetera. And that's the local assessments and planning aspect. So looking at um, how are we supporting the regional partnership and engagement, getting all the folks together at the table to look at um, developing local strategies. And I also wanna express it is happening in areas um, and it's not saying that it's not, it's building off of it and providing additional support um, and looking at different aspects of those local assessments as well um, that are missing and how we can provide that support. Um, and that's another piece um, is the decision support information hub, SARA network and accomplishment tracking and dashboard that we called out in the strategy. Um, one of them being the decision support information hub is a centralized area where there's uh, data and information that can be utilized to start looking at these localized strategies. Um, once again, as we're putting this together, piecing data from all over the place, trying to understand what is the right data, et cetera, and bringing that together and bringing the scientific experts to really work together um, within that SARA network, which is that scientific and resource assessment to help us understand at a state level where are the priority areas and the local levels and bridge that gap. Um, once again, just a special you know, shout out to the INR team, really provided some capacity that we didn't have and the expertise and having Sean here helping explain this is really important. And that's kind of the idea. So who are the other experts that we can bring in to really help us understand this at a local level and a state level. And then the accomplishment tracking and dashboard um, is a critical piece of it is um, there is information out there. Um, how do we start feeding that into a centralized 
accomplishment tracking. How many acres are we treated? Where are we treating those acres? What are these costs? Um, and start feeding that into a system. When we have this question, which I am guaranteeing will come up again, um, it's not a phone a friend and try to figure it out. It's trying to understand this information within different regions and different levels. And that's where we can provide resources too. If we're seeing extremely high cost breakers in certain areas, how do we analyze that and try to come up with creative solutions to reduce that cost and provide the right resources? Um, and then that dashboard displaying the information is a critical piece that we've heard a lot about is where is that centralized area that shows what have we accomplished um, and are we meeting our targets that we're trying to achieve? Um, it's a lot of spaghetti that I just threw down, but I just want to hit on that really um, I hear that we want to um, get to more of a refined level. We want to start understanding where those areas, what those costs are, all the conversation today are the hard questions um, that we need to start answering and feeling that um, those are the aspects that we need to start putting into place to better understand refining the priorities, um, looking at what are the true costs, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so I just wanted to throw some of those out there um, of we as the agencies and developing the strategy desire to get to the place that we all wanna get to, um, but it's gonna take some time, take resources, take energy as well. So um, just wanted to see if folks, um, uh, any response to that or thoughts or questions on that aspect, and then um, I go ahead and, and transition this out as well. But want to leave some space, um, kind of for so, some of those near-term components that we've put together and are starting to call out, and obtaining the resources for. Amanda, Nathan, is the Sarah dashboard? Is that going to? Is that what it is supposed to be called? <laughs> Yeah, we're looking at the Sarah, uh, the Sarah is the kind of science group to support all this work. And really, the INR team has been leading that work. Um, and the idea is there are big questions that are being asked and having the resources and the, the scientific support to help answer those questions like we just saw, saw here. Okay, yeah. And so that dashboard, we feel like we, and, and that kind of Sarah process framework, we feel like we need to develop or ODF feels like it needs to be developed or the SLG, whatever, um, feels like it needs to be developed first because we don't have all of the information that we need to be able to move forward or we want to have that in place at, so that we have a tracking mechanism in place once we do start implementing. Is that sort of the thought behind? Yeah, a couple of thoughts. Um we in a way have it somewhat in place with the INR team helping support this, but there's more work that needs to happen. Like we've all identified, we need to bring out, bring together more resources to to help answer some of these big questions. Um, and that's where, um, when we talk about local assessments and we talk about some of these local plans is also providing that support for these folks and not saying, Hey, we want local assessments and local plans. We want to also provide the scientific expertise and the data to help you get there. Um, understanding locally driven what is really needed and where are the key aspects that are missing. The dashboard is to show, um, it's kind of the, the back end of it to show what is the progress of when we say we want to treat this many acres or we want to try to achieve this outcome, um, are we, are we not getting there? Um, and understanding what are we currently um, treating in, in the state right now? And that's even a hard question to answer of where are we placing the treatments? Um, and how many acres are we treating um, and starting to bridge that and then feed into all of this as well. Okay. And I'm also wondering as far as that data collection and how we visually represent that, um, since we are partnering with federal agencies and other state agencies, um, and obviously ODF has ferns, and so you have access to private land notifications and when that gets completed. Um, are you kind of going to have access to through these partnerships, the um, like cut and sold reports from Forest Service and BLM and like, obviously, it's a lot easier to find information related to timber sale acres, right, but that doesn't tell us what actually got treated and when it actually got treated. So in like their fax database so because you know, timber sale cut and sold, that's only for timber sales. And then there's all the non-commercial work. And, and, and so I guess, you know, do you feel like you're going to have access to all of that? Because any information that goes on there needs to be the same type of information, whether it's, you know, sold 
or planned or, you know, actually treated, you know, post-treatment. So yep. I guess, how are you thinking about that? Yeah, that's a good question as well. So a couple of thoughts here. One of them is through the strategy, we identify 35 funding sources currently um, and understanding those 35 funding sources in a way of tracking all that information. Once again, right now, it's in a lot of different places and looking at those common denominators of, of what are folks collecting and where are they not. Um, and then thinking about how can we integrate with all the different agencies to have some commonality behind it, um, which that alone can be a huge challenge. And how do we look at different uh, policy changes or different ways of looking at our programs in order to bring that information? If there are certain areas that aren't tracking this or are tracking that. Um, that's kind of the idea of it to have one centralized area. I will also mention here, um, it is in very much theory and we want to continue to drive this. And there are a lot of aspects to figure it out. And that goes into the transition to what does the future look like? putting these pieces into place, but getting um, the support and working through the process of understanding what does need to be in there and what does not on, on multiple different levels. Um, so I'll, I'll stop there. Um, hopefully that someone answers the question and happily anyone else who wants to kick in on that, please do. Um, and also looking at time as well. Yeah, I, I guess I just want a straight answer on whether or not the Forest Service has said that you will have access to facts into that database and that they'll provide that. I mean, is that a yes? Like they want well, to fully really integrate that? I don't, I don't have a straight answer for that now. Um, Sean, I don't know if, you know, we've had initial conversations, but we haven't gotten to that point. I, I thought the facts data was generally publicly available. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't think it is. No, it's proprietary. Hmm. Well, I'll just jump in and say that, you know, I, I've really appreciated this conversation because it highlights the nuance and challenge of uh, trying to bring all these pieces together. And that's the work that we've been up, up for and we are up for moving forward, uh, particularly on the data sharing piece. You know, as long as I've been in natural resources, right, I, I think everybody can agree that has been a huge challenge. Mm -hmm. And particularly in this space, uh, if we're looking at data from ODF, from the Forest Service, from BLM, from NRCS. Uh, we all have different pieces of that pie. We all report the data differently. Uh, if we're talking about work on private lands, we have to be um, cognizant of, of uh, privacy rights that those private landowners have and uh, figure out a way to harvest that data and display it in a way that's respectful of that. Um, those are all things that you know we've been challenged for as long as I can remember and, and will continue in the future, but I'm really hopeful through um, the shared stewardship work group that Nathan has pulled together, we'll be able to overcome some of those hurdles and come to some agreement around a way to share some of that data and tell a consistent story. Um, and at the same time, be able to um, use that data to plan where, where we put treatments on the ground. That's, I mean, that's the goal. Um, but you've correctly identified one of many hurdles, right, to make that happen. Yeah, and Ryan, just quickly, I, I bring that up because for me personally, um, and I think for our organization, I care a lot more about the work actually getting completed than displaying it. I think that we can always create a narrative. We can always do internal reporting. I just for as long as I have been engaged with this with this work and when I was working for the Forest Service, I think everybody has wanted to get at this exact thing that you're talking about, Nathan. There's been bills in Congress trying to create transparency for how the Forest Service reports acres treated and, and work accomplished. And, you know, are we double counting acres for different types of treatments or, you know, and all these things. And we've never solved that. So I just want to be um, realistic in what our goals are and not let us get caught up in that if we think that that has to be completed before we move forward with actually getting things done. So, you know, I'm, I don't have all the answers. I just wanted to highlight some of the nuance there um, and just, you know, tr trying to be realistic with the process. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. It's good, good feedback. And I think that's kind of what we do right now and will continue to do. Um, I just also know that uh, we are always challenged to provide good numbers and good data when anybody comes to us. And the, the more we can do to do a better job at that, um, the better off we'll be. And I also, I have to run uh, to the next one as well. Appreciate yeah. everybody's time. Yeah, thank you for that.
Um, I see that folks are are running. I just want to thank everyone for their time. Um, there are some some great feedback and great follow up um, items as well. So um, thank you all. I hope you enjoy the rest of the beautiful day, and and I'm sure we'll be talking soon. And and I will follow up soon. Thank you.